Hello, I'm Gina Davies and the workshop you're about to see was filmed in front of a live audience. This workshop is thinking about sleep, or perhaps I should say the lack of it. Over the last 20 years, I've worked with many autistic children and their families, and some of the main problems that we're tackling become even more difficult because the child isn't sleeping. And when the child doesn't sleep, nor does the parents and the rest of the family also has difficulty getting enough rest. Knowing how to sleep is a life skill and it takes time and effort to help children who find this difficult get it right. But this workshop is focused very much on helping parents understand how to tackle getting their child to bed, getting them to stay there all night, how to fall asleep, stay asleep, and become well rested so that when they wake in the morning, they're ready for the day and to tackle all the things that they need to learn. And so that parents and the family can flourish in a well rested environment too. I hope you find this workshop useful. Why don't you let me know how you get on? Email me at contact at ginadavies.co.uk. Thank you. Well, um, we're going to talk about sleep. And um, so many of us have very clear ideas about what we think um, a child should do at bedtime and what we hope is going to follow. And um, we kind of pitch those into our expectations and we hope that our child will kiss us goodnight and after a bit of a cuddle we'll lie down and go to sleep and um, that we basically we won't see them again until the morning when they will uh, wake gently and be delighted to see us and put their little arms around our necks and kiss us good morning and, and it's all going to be glorious and certainly when I had children myself um, I had that kind of idea that that's how it was going to be and with my first child more or less apart from you know, moments when she was teething, that was pretty much what it was like and fairly quickly um, she began to sleep through the night and we all began to feel quite human and it, it was great. Um, and then I had my son and uh, my son did not sleep through the night and uh, didn't sleep through the night um, ever really and I began to behave a bit like a mad woman and thought that I was losing my marbles because the reality for me was actually that my son would wake repeatedly during the night, I would get up repeatedly during the night and develop all kinds of tricks to try and get him to sleep and I became more and more desperate um, for rest myself and um, in the meantime my son would nod off in the buggy in the back of the car, he would have a little lie down and a ziz uh, on the sofa and he actually was fine because he was getting as much sleep as he needed but he was dotting it across the 24 hour period whereas I was becoming very sleep deprived um, and a bit hysterical. So for me it became, it became even harder to work out how I was going to solve the problem. All the time I was thinking of short term solutions and I remember one night thinking, um, oh I know, he usually nods off in the car. So I got my daughter out of bed, put her in her coat, put her in the car, then got my son in his coat, put him in the car and drove round the block until my son dropped off. My daughter by that time was wide awake and quite chatty. Um, and the whole thing, when I look back, was absolutely mad. But one of the things that happens when you're sleep deprived is that you go for short term solutions and you can only think in the short term. You're always trying to solve the problem as it happens and it's really difficult to get a plan going. Um, and you begin to feel really uh, very strange. You wonder about whether this is you personally being a useless parent. Certainly I had that thought. And all the time you know that it's got to be different but you can't work out how to, how to achieve that and you hope um, uh, rather optimistically that the child will grow out of it. But when there's autism in the mix, that's very unlikely. We actually need to do something about it. Um, but we need to think about what happens with sleep, what happens with sleep and autism in particular. 
um, how we can think that through logically and um, how we can make a plan that will work for your family and your child. And that needs to be quite individual because what I might think was okay to do with a child might not be what matched what you feel you could do in your house. It might be that I have one child aged three and another aged eight. It might be that you've got three children under five. So we need to think it through so that it works for you. And we need to work out how to keep going with the plan because it's not going to be sorted in one night or two nights. It's going to take several nights uh, in order to, ch to get the change. And then we're going to think through some of the practical hints and tips which are slightly less barking mad than driving around the block endlessly with your child in the back of the car um, and it mean that everybody in the family gets rested and I think you know that's really important because rest uh, improves your quality of life. So I think before we start there is a little bit we need to think in terms of safety. If your child snores or has any kind of breathing difficulty or asthma if they take any medication, or if they have epilepsy, or if they have any medical condition that might disturb their night's sleep, you do need to get advice from your doctor before you start, so that you know exactly what you're dealing with and, and where you would need to adapt the plan to um, match those kind of additional problems. So particularly snoring, um, that's one we, we could easily miss because lots of people snore, but we just need to run that past the doctor first. Snoring, uh, breathing difficulties including asthma, any kind of medication, epilepsy, or any um, medical condition that might disturb a child's sleep, get advice from your doctor before you start. ready for the off. And really it's a question of autistic children seem to present with a whole muddle of things that go wrong at night time from everything that, that means they've got to have their toys lined up in a particular order and if one falls off then we have to start again, this kind of obsessional arranging of things, that can be a part of the problem. It could be that they are clutching the iPad and watching a YouTube clip repeatedly until they actually fall asleep. Or it could be that they go to bed and fall asleep but then they get up repeatedly in the night or that they start the day very early. It's a whole collection of things but basically what happens is that the people around them and often the child themselves are not getting enough rest. But we need to understand what is normal. Um, I had this kind of idea that I could put my children to bed after a long bath um, and they'd be in bed by seven and I wouldn't see them again until seven in the morning because that suited me. Um, you know, then I could go to bed at 11, 11.30 and wake up at seven to get them ready for the day. But in fact, we do need to be very realistic about how much sleep does a child need. And often I think we overestimate how much they need. So for a child between one and three, we're looking at between 12 and 14 hours across a 24 hour period. So if your child sleeps during the day, that counts as a part of the 12 or 14 hours. Right? So when you're thinking about your child, think about their chronological age. If they're between 1 and 3, 12 to 14 hours sleep a day, and that's an average. So some children will need more and some children will need less. Okay, but 12 to 14 hours. Between the ages of 3 and 6, it's 10 to 12 hours of sleep. And between the ages of 10 and 11, 10 or 11 hours sleep. So we need immediately start to think, that's, what's, that's what happens for typically developing children. How much sleep does your child need? And we need to be thinking about that quite clearly. You need to do a calculation. What time do you put them to bed? What time do they fall asleep? If they wake, how long are they awake for? So we're counting the sleeping hours at night and add to that any napping or sleeping during the day to get your total. Um, and then the other thing we need to do is to remember that it is normal to wake up at night. We all have periods of deep sleep and that's the, you know, often happens in the first four hours of the night where your child falls gradually into a deep sleep and that's the point where you can move them, you can pick them up and their muscles are very relaxed and the child is deeply asleep and you, you can't easily rouse them. 
And then later on in the period of sleep, what you get is a lighter level of sleep, and that's perfectly normal. And in that lighter level, as you can see here from this hypnogram, the child actually pops up to the surface and is awake briefly and then falls back down to sleep, and then is awake briefly and then falls back down to sleep. And that's entirely normal. It is normal to wake up a couple of times or to be very near waking a couple of times a night, and for some people, more than that. And it's important for us to remember that because a part of the difficulty that the autistic child has is when they come through to wake, they wake up completely and think, da, -da the day's starting, we're out of bed, we're on the floor, you know, our feet are on the floor, perhaps we're turning the lights on, we want everybody to get up and have breakfast, and it's only two o'clock in the morning. And the problem is the child doesn't know how to fall back to sleep on their own. But we need to remember, waking up at night is normal as is knowing how to go back to sleep again on your own. Um, if we think about uh, autistic children, there is a lot of research around sleep patterns, but I think as families we need to keep it really simple, which is, you know, what's the problem? Um, it's quite likely if you have a child with autism that your child will have a sleep difficulty, but let's remember it's quite common for periods of time with typically developing children too. Um, so in typically developing children, 50% of them will have a sleep problem at some point, but in autism it goes up to about 70%. So if your child has a diagnosis of autism, there's more than a 50-50 chance that you're going to have difficulties with sleep at some point. Um, and if they looked at a group of children with autism and they looked at what kind of sleep difficulties did they have and it was difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, multiple wakings, um, difficulty because you wake up too soon to start the day and bedwetting. So in fact it's exactly the same sort of problems that typically developing children have, but you get more of them more persistently. And that's where the, the autism thing comes in, is it kind of sets the child's thinking in stone. You know, if they wake at two, they wake at two, they're gonna wake at two, um, because they're very good at sticking to patterns. Um, and if they take an hour and a half to fall asleep, then that is the pattern that's repeated. So we get this problem with repeated, um, rather rigid patterns of, of behavior. Um, but the good news is that the majority of sleep problems do respond very well to a basic sleep intervention. It doesn't have to be anything radically different. It will be difficult. You will have to be persistent um, and you have got to know what you're doing. But um, for the vast majority of children with autism, the outcome is very good. Okay, So we can be optimistic, but we know we're going to have to do some work in order to achieve that. Um, if we think about why bother, you know, this short-term thinking that we get into when we're exhausted ourselves, I think it's important to remember that you get exhausted children who get very crabby very quickly, um, who get irritated, who are a bit volatile, and that is actually an effect of sleep deprivation. It's a part of how our brain reacts. If we don't get enough sleep, we become highly emotional. And that, that's a real problem because it makes us very reactive as opposed to thinking in advance and planning it through and perhaps calming ourselves down, perhaps it's not as bad as I thought, I only stubbed my toe. If you're sleep deprived, you stub your toe, you burst into tears, you rage and you feel absolutely insulted by the injury. And it's not actually that the stubbed toe was any worse, it's just that you are sleep deprived and that is the effect it has. And in families struggling with um, children with autism and sleep deprivation, you have that for the child and for the adults caring for them. So it becomes really difficult to make a good plan. And we do need to remember that if you are sleep deprived, it's harder to learn anything. So it becomes a real struggle and it's not helping our child learn the things that they need to learn. And you get an increase in challenging behaviours because the child is reacting all the time and they don't have the kind of social codes that says you mustn't hit when you get cross, so you get more hitting and you get more rushing about very often. And you know, for the children it becomes harder to complete the school day and for us as the parents it becomes harder to, to complete our day with all the things that we're doing. But from the child's point of view, they don't necessarily think there's a problem. 
because they lack social awareness. So you might be, you know, crumpled in a heap, absolutely exhausted, weeping over a cup of coffee. I remember those days myself. But the child is not deliberately not sleeping to make you miserable. That's not a part of this. You are miserable because you're sleep deprived, but your child has very little understanding that it's as a result of the fact that they're not sleeping in their bed at night for long enough. And there's also quite good research now to support um, the evidence that some children with autism don't make enough melatonin. And melatonin is the naturally occurring hormone that is produced when uh, it gets dark. And that's the hormone that makes you feel sleepy and drowsy and helps you fall asleep. And for some children with autism, actually just switching off, particularly for the children who worry or need to complete com particular cycles of thinking or particular actions, they find it very difficult to switch that off and to become calm and restful. Um, so actually falling asleep is a real challenge. And some children have developed habits around how they behave in the evening and at night. Um, Co-sleeping, that is sleeping with your mum and dad, is a very common one, you know, and it's a response to being desperate for some sleep. You just think, oh, bring him into our bed and he'll fall asleep. Then that becomes the child's expectation. That becomes what they understand happens. So, of course, then they do it again and again. And uh, one of the things that I found very difficult when I was coping with sleep deprivation was, you know, why couldn't I solve the problem? I was desperate for a night's sleep. You know, I remember one point uh, when my son was about three, I remember being so desperate, um, you know, that I would put him in the buggy. And at one point I'd noticed that when I went over the little ridge, um, between the carpet and my kitchen, that kind of little jiggling motion uh, seemed to help him fall asleep. So I'm there with him in the buggy at two o'clock in the morning going backwards and forwards over the carpet runner. And that's bonkers. Instead of being able to think, um, what do I need to change to get my son to sleep in his own bed all night on his own? I need to, to alter what I'm doing. And it's because I was tired. I was too tired to think and plan. I might have had a good idea, but come seven o'clock I've forgotten it. And three o'clock in the morning I can't remember my own name, let alone the plan. And, and the other thing is, you know, very often we're parenting as a team with our husband or our partner or our wife, and very often people have slightly different rules. Um, you know, so I might say we're going to ignore him crying and put him back in bed, but my husband might crack and pick him up and walk him. And I'm only going to walk him round twice, but in that walking round, giving, rocking him, we've changed the rules. Um, so it's hard to be consistent, um, you know, when you're partnering with, uh, with somebody else to do uh, a programme. And the other problem is that actually, if your child is very difficult during the day, and life is extremely troubling, and you're worrying about your child's future, those moments when your child is cosy and snuggly and relaxed in your arms become a very powerful part of how you keep your connection with your child and it's very tempting to prolong those moments. And the other thing is we're just hanging on to our nerve, surviving and coping and just getting through moment to moment um, and we make a lot of compromises. Um, certainly I didn't expect my son to co-sleep with me in my bed, I didn't expect to be sitting in the end of a cot for hours myself. I didn't expect to be moving this kind of party beds where everybody shuffles beds in order to try and get the person who's most desperate, desperate for sleep into a bed where they can sleep on their own for longer. But we need to keep um, a sleep diary and that's a really unpopular piece of advice to give parents because I know what the problem is. He can't sleep. I'm desperate for him to go sleep. He wakes up at night. Um, but we do need to know what the pattern is for your child in detail because when we start to change it you're not going to go from he wakes four times at night having taken an hour and a half to settle and starts the day at five to he goes to bed at eight sleeps all night wakes at seven we are not going to shift from one way of sleeping in the night to the other quickly it might be that we go from waking four times a night to three times a night to two times a night, then we have a bad couple of days where we're definitely six times a night and we're hanging on to our sanity, and then we start to drop to two times a night and gradually we get to once a night. If you don't know exactly how many times he was waking before, you won't spot the progress and you'll feel that the program isn't working and you will give up. 
and giving up is one of the biggest problems. We give up too soon. So we do need a sleep diary. We need to know what time do you start putting your child to bed. Okay, so it might be at seven o'clock, you put him in the bath and um, he's in the bath for 20 minutes and then you get him out and there's a bit of chasing up and down um, trying to get him into his nappy and pyjamas and that takes another 20 minutes and then um, you put a DVD on and the child sits on the sofa and then by nine o'clock the child has fallen asleep and you put them into bed and um, they sleep and then at 11.30 the child wakes up for the first time and you sit on the bed and rub their back and then 20 minutes later they fall asleep and then they are awake at 2 where you repeat the same thing and then at 3 you wake up and find your child is in bed with you and then you both start the day at 6.30. But you actually need to know what times are attached to these things and the easiest way to do it is to put the piece of paper and the pencil next to the child's bed okay because it's in the night you've only got to scroll on that piece of paper the time okay you haven't got to write in detail what happened but you just want the times and any times that the child slept during the day 10 minutes nodding off in the back of the car when you went to the supermarket five minutes in the buggy waiting to pick up your other child from school um, and perhaps an hour blissfully um, in the afternoon uh, in front of the telly okay you really need to know how much sleep they've got, and then I want you to add it up. So you need at least five days. Five days of sleep record, okay? So just jot it down on a piece of paper and then do the maths, okay? And what's gone wrong for your child, okay? When you look at that, you will now know very clearly what the problem is. Is it the falling asleep? Is it the staying asleep? Is it the getting up too soon? Is it bedwetting? Or what's most likely is you've got a mixture of all of them. One we can knock on the head very quickly around bedwetting is to remember that staying dry at night doesn't happen for some children until they're about seven. So if they're dry and toilet trained during the day, but wetting the bed consistently at night. If we're going to crack a sleep program, one of the things to do is to look at the amount of fluid you're giving your child. Don't give them anything to drink in the three quarters of an hour before bed. Um, take them to the toilet just before you put them into bed and then perhaps put them in a night nappy. Okay? And as soon as they wake up in the morning, you take the night nappy off. When they've stopped wetting the night nappy, that's the time to stop worrying about bed wetting. Okay? So the child will become dry um, almost on their own. If you've got a big problem with uh, bedwetting then we need uh, to think about that uh, in the toilet training workshop. Um, but which problem have you got or have you got more than one? Most people have more than one of this uh, list going wrong for them. And if we're thinking about what we're going to change, we want things to change for the child um, and things to change for us. Okay? We just want the child to stop doing the things that they're doing that are driving us bonkers at night. But in order to bring that about, we will have to change what we are doing. If you have a child who is, has problems sleeping, despite your best efforts now, we kind of have to accept that what you're doing at the moment is not working if the problem is continuing. And that's the tough bit, because sometimes it works, very often sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, and that kind of, round, what's called random reinforcement, very powerfully makes us think we're almost there, whereas in fact the, the problem is continuing. But if the child has got a sleep problem, and what you're doing at the moment is not changing that, we need to change the way we're handling bedtimes and night times, and that falls to us. We are the ones that find it easier to change, the child with autism finds it very difficult to change, so we're going to have to make the change. So we're going to have to do something differently. And who is going to help us as the adults making the change? Because we're already tired. <laughs> and it's hard to hold on to the plan when you're knackered. So who is going to support you? Who's going to show an interest in what a good job you're doing and you know to listen to you on the good days and the bad days and keep you going? Who do you have in your network 
who can do that for you. And that's really important that you find someone who's going to support you. Even if it's just someone who rings you every couple of days and goes, how's it going? Well done. That's fantastic. You're doing a good job. Just to remind you that you are actually investing in something that is going to improve your child's quality of life uh, for now and the future. It's a really big thing to achieve. And we need to get practical. And remember, it's really hard when you're tired. And so the first thing that you're going to do is something that we know that we can all crack, OK? Um, and it's really important to start thinking about how are you going to get ready to do this? Have you actually got enough in the tank to pull off a sleep programme, which means you're going to have to stick to some new rules for three weeks? Have you got enough in the tank? Or do you need to rest a bit yourself first. And I think we forget, you know, if you're up four or five times in the night, maybe losing a couple of hours sleep at least, and then starting the day at five, you are actually doing the equivalent of shift work. And people who do shift work are expected to sleep for periods during the day. And yet parents expect themselves to be able to do all day and all night without um, taking a sleep and a rest during the day. So if you are doing the equivalent of shift work, in order to prepare yourself for a sleep programme, I suggest that you go to bed and sleep for 45 minutes in the day for at least three days, just to begin to restore your own need for rest before you start the programme. So in terms of preparing yourself, that would be a really good way forward. And if you're working full time, then maybe you're going to have to take three days off in order to get this sorted. You've got to get yourself into the right state of mind to, to pull it off. And, you know, we do need to ask ourselves, as a family, is this the priority at the moment? Or have we got other things that are higher up the list? Because it is hard to stick to a sleep programme. You have got to be glued together as a family group. So you wouldn't want to start a sleep programme if in a week's time you're going on holiday, or if in a week's time you've got relatives coming to stay and the children are all going to have to share a bedroom. Okay? So we really need to think, is this a good block of time? You want at least three weeks that you can lay out just for this, where you're really going to think about it and um, work through it. So we want to make a plan for three weeks. For some people, with your doctor's approval and support, you might try melatonin, which can be, you know, for the children it works with is miraculous. You give it to them and 40 minutes later they're yawning and falling asleep. Absolutely amazing. For some children it has no impact. Um, but you will still have to do a sleep program. <laughs> the melatonin is not going to be the solution on its own. But you will have to do a sleep program in the end. And the first thing you're going to do before you do anything else, okay, this is step one, and we can all do this, is you're going to have a massive tidy in the bedroom. The bedroom must become a visually calm and quiet space for all the senses. And I think that's a big challenge because we live in smaller spaces now, so we tend to use children's bedrooms as entertainment centres and playrooms. You know, so that's where all the toys are, maybe there's um, a computer in there or a TV or a DVD player. We really need to look at the child's bedroom. It should be that when you walk in, that it is visually calm and quiet. So, for example, this would be a really good visually calm, quiet area here. Okay, it's not covered in posters, it's not covered in photographs, we haven't got dangling um, mobiles, we haven't got banners running across the room, we haven't got multi-coloured carpet, colourful um, bedding, perhaps you know, with Thomas the Tank Engine or whatever the favourite cartoon of the child rushing about, and um, the, the toys are in boxes with lids on. Okay, so you need to make a big investment in storage or in moving everything out of the bedroom and putting it in a different room. When you walk in, it should look visually calm and quiet. And if you're not able to, to um, do that for the entire day, it should be at bedtime that all the distractions are taken out so that it is calm and quiet. We don't want to be keeping the child's brain awake by stimulating it with all these different things to look at. So we've got to really invest some time and thought in how we're going to do that. Um, so it needs to be a safe and restful space. 
Don't use it as the place you send your child to if they've been naughty or if they've been difficult because we don't want to complicate the child's understanding of what a bedroom is for. A bedroom is for sleeping in at night. That's, that's what we're heading for. You need to get the light sorted. Okay? You need to make sure that the room is really dark. Okay? There are all sorts of blinds, blackout blinds available, um, but if that's too expensive, you can blue tack black paper onto the glass at night. Because when you pull the curtains across, you want to be sure that it is really dark. Of course, in the winter, it's not so difficult, but um, during the summer, you know, it's light for a long part of the evening and it light very early in the morning. We want darkness because darkness gives a visual cue that it's night, it's time to sleep. And um, darkness is also very important in the creation of melatonin. It's what triggers um, the production of melatonin. So we're going for dark. We want it to be quiet, so we need carpet. If you um, don't want to put carpet in your children's bedroom, you need a rug, something that absorbs the sound, okay, so that it is quiet. We need calm colours and we need, you know, we need safe furniture because if the child gets a bit cross and understands that they can bring you rushing to their bedroom by pulling a drawer out and throwing it across the room, then that's, you know, that gives the child um, a very useful tool for making sure that parents arrive on cue. So look at the furniture, make sure that it's safe, make sure that it's sturdy, and, and we're off. So a really big tidy up. Um, and here, this is probably the least popular bit of advice that I have to give, which is no TVs or computers or handheld game devices in the bedroom. But unfortunately, we can't ignore it, but the flashing, brightly coloured images that come off a screen keep the brain stimulated, therefore awake. And that is what we are trying to change. We want the child to feel rested, to feel calm, and to feel low stimulation, okay? not high stimulation. There are a large number of children who fall asleep watching the television, and, and so it can, this piece of advice can feel counterintuitive, but in the night, when they wake, their brain will drive them to seek exactly the same situation that they understand helps them fall asleep. That is, television on. So then you get into this thing about do you put the telly on in the night, do you put the telly on when they wake up too early? And actually we're not training the child to become restful and to fall asleep peacefully on their own without stimulation. So, no televisions, computers or anything like that in the bedroom. If you do have them in the bedroom during the day, they must come out as a part of the bedtime routine. Similarly, we don't want a neon flashing moving clock in the room and we don't want any kind of, um, you know, uh, there are an awful lot of fairy lights and things available in the shops at the moment, we don't want any of those either. Okay, so we want the bedroom to be calm and quiet and nothing in there to keep the child's brain awake and thinking. And the other thing is that um, children are spending long periods of time uh, on the computer or perhaps with the television because this, this plays to such a wonderful autism strength, the visual learning. And they are so good at these things. Um, you know, they're spending very long periods of time uh, using them. But these devices don't wear a child out physically. So some children are simply not physically tired at the end of the day. And if you've got a very active autistic child, they need even more exercise, okay? The fact that they're whizzing about all the time and sort of tiddling around and on their feet a lot, they're not physically tired. They are capable of even more physical output. So you need to make sure that your child is physically tired. They need to walk, they need to run, they need to cycle, they need to scoot on a scooter, they need to be climbing um, playground equipment, they need to be out and about and doing. And that's tough because actually if your child's unreliable, one way you can make it round the shops is to put them in a buggy. But if they're in a buggy, they are not taking physical exercise. We put them in the car because we've got a lot to fit in the day, but they are not exercising. Okay? And a child needs to be physically tired. What can you add into your child's day that is going to give them real physical exertions, particularly in the afternoon, or certainly after the last sleep in the day? Okay? Physical exercise. Very important.
There are some bits of equipment and all sorts of things that you can buy on the internet which are, are there to help you uh, get your child to sleep. Um, uh, and there are some that work and some that uh, might work and some that are more trouble than they're worth. But we, we need to think them through. Massage, deep pressure massage, given safely and appropriately by a, a trusted adult, is very good for calming children down. Okay, so massage is something that you might want to add to your child's routine. Weighted blankets are very much around and about at the moment. Um, you can certainly buy them on most of the internet sites. It's interesting that there are so many available second hand on some of the resale sites, which would perhaps would suggest that people are trying them and not sticking with them. The problem with weighted blankets is um, that you can put them on. They do deliver deep pressure, which can help your child feel um, comforted and reassured, which is great, but you really can't leave them on all night for safety reasons. So again, you're perhaps setting up something where you're going to have to get up in the night and put it back on if your child waits and then when they've fallen asleep, take it off again. So, you know, you need to think about that very carefully. White noise has been found for some children to, to help, but I, th I think that's a tricky one. Lavender oil is safe for most ages. Certainly you can use social stories. And social stories can be really useful, but they are the long game. They are the kind of gradual explanation. But the child is just coping day to day, sticking to what they know. So they're not necessarily going to change the child's um, philosophy on what should happen at bedtime, but they're very useful. We use picture strips to explain, where we just draw a line of pictures. Um, and you can use um, photographs and symbols. But in the end, Never mind all these tricks, in the end you are going to have to stick to a sleep programme. These are things you can add in, but in themselves, in isolation, they're not going to be the answer, unfortunately. Okay, let's get to the, the bedtime routine. You're going to have to decide what you're going to do, but you do have a very clear idea of what really happens now. Okay, What really happens now might be you get the children... They've had a bath and your child is in their pyjamas and they're sitting having um, their last drink of the day watching the television. Daddy comes in! Everybody's very interested. Daddy comes in from work. There's a bit of rushing about, a bit of rough and tumble, a bit of tickling games, a little bit of trying to ask the child how their day's been and then Daddy's exhausted and he wants to sit quietly and have a cup of coffee. Now the child is buzzing. Okay, so then it takes a little bit longer for them to wind down. But what we want to do is to establish a wind down hour before you put your child to bed. So if you're going to put your child to bed at 8, the wind down hour is the time between 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the evening. And the wind down hour is when you're going to invest your time and energy in giving your child all the attention they need, but gradually bringing down the levels of stimulation. So there is no television, no computer, no handheld games, no phone use, no using the phone instead of the computer to play games in that last hour. Now, our last hour before bed, we are becoming calm, we are winding down. You need to decide your bedtime routine. Is it bath, pyjamas, brush your teeth, store two stories, leg massage, lights out? You know, you need to know what is your routine. Things like brushing your teeth, and um, a lot of autistic children actually hate having their teeth brushed, whether you like having them brushed or not, it's very stimulating. So you want to get that earlier in the process. It's not just before you get into bed, because brushing your teeth stimulates you and keeps you awake, particularly if you don't like it and you have a bit of a fuss over it. Okay? Really think about your bedtime routine. What is the routine? I think once you're in your pyjamas, you should stay upstairs. But you know, that's just me. But if you're going to bring them downstairs, it's not to sit on the sofa to watch the television for an hour. That's not, that's not what we're up to anymore. Okay? And there might be some children who feel rather strongly about that. You know, they might feel they're being deprived, but this is an investment in making sure you give your child the attention and the time they need to become calm. And that's really, really important. There's no getting away from it. And it takes about an hour for a child to wind down. You actually want them to be thinking, this is, yeah, I've 
had enough of this. I'm getting a little bit bored. I might as well go to bed. Not, if I go upstairs, I'll miss the end of this. Or if I go upstairs, I'll miss Daddy coming in. Or I wonder who's coming round to have a cup of coffee with Mummy tonight. If I wait and see, it might be um, Auntie Mary. We don't want that kind of thing. We want the kind of thinking of, yeah, the day's come to a close. It's okay. I'm feeling calm. And now I'm feeling sleepy. That's what we're aiming for. Um, and then you need to decide what kind of intervention you're going to use. Are you going to put your child in bed and every time they get out, put them back again? Okay, you're going to do the repeated placing in bed. Are you going to do the, I'm going to sit on the end of the bed until they fall asleep. And then after a week of that, I'm going to sit on the floor between the bed and the door. And then I'm going to sit on a chair in the doorway. Then I'm going to sit at the top of the stairs. Are you going to do that? Um, or you can do scheduled waking. So there is one particular approach. If your child wakes at a consistent time of night, so if they wake at 2 o'clock, you know that if you go in at 20 to 2 and just settle your child, they won't actually wake. Right? So that um, way of kind of anticipating the child becoming restless and you go in and you just settle them so they don't actually wake, that can break the pattern as well. But if your child is co-sleeping, that is sleeping with you, or you are lying down with them until they fall asleep, you might find it quite hard to put them into bed and leave the room. Okay, because, you, I mean, people do. They say, well, as soon as I leave the room, he'll walk out after me. And you're right, he will, because normally you lie down. Okay, and this time you're not, so there must be something wrong with you, so I'm just checking. So the child will come out and you put them in, okay, and they get up, they get up and they walk out again. Okay, and you put them back and they get up and they walk out again. And so it goes on and you think, well, that's mad. It's much better when I lie down with him, at least he stays in bed. Hmm. But then if you lie down with them at night to get them to go to sleep, when they wake up in the night, they will, of course, come to look for you. Because how do you fall asleep? You fall asleep with mummy or daddy lying down next to me in the bed. And they need to repeat the same circumstances, okay, the same situation. But you need to work out what can you live with. Because if you keep putting your child back into bed, um, they might cry. Are you, are you going to be able to ignore that and keep going? Because it's no good if when they start crying, you pick them up and give them a cuddle. And go, it's all right, don't worry. And then you lie down with them. Because they think, oh, their brain is learning, okay. So we go in and out of the bedroom five or six times. Then mummy picks me up and gives me a cuddle. And then she lies down with me. Okay, so now that's what's going to happen every time they wake up. So you've got to think, what do you, as an individual, feel you can cope with? And if you're going to follow the sleep programme with somebody else, your partner, then will they stick to the same rules? Or will one of you crack when a child cries? Okay. For me, with my son, I did the putting them back into bed and walking out. And it, it was really tough because he did cry. And he did get upset because he was confused. This is not normally how it works. Normally I go for a ride in the car, I'm clicked about in the buggy, mummy walks up and down, you know. I go downstairs and stroke the cat for 20 minutes while she drinks tea. This is not what normally happens. So it was a big shock for him. Um, but I was investing in helping him develop sleep patterns which would be healthy for him for life. So three weeks worth of me putting him back into bed. Okay. And I've just been uh, working on a sleep programme with another mummy who um, is doing the putting her child back into bed. And on night one, she did it 33 times. And, you know, that is pushing pretty much to the limit. And everybody's beginning to think, you know, what was the advice that stupid woman gave me? Can't she see it's not working? But of course, the child is simply doing what they know usually works and they're autistic, so they'll be more, pers more persistent. Um, you know, so it takes a while for the child to realise this is not working anymore. But you need to settle on whatever it is that's going to work for you. Okay, so if your child um, expects you to lie down with them, um, and, and that is what usually happens. I mean, wonderfully what typically happens is the child lies down, the parent lies down, 
and then the parent falls asleep. <laughs> They're so knackered, so now you have both child and parent asleep uh, in the child's bed, but then the parent will get up and move to their bed. But it is really important to, to know you are tired, okay, you might have managed to get three days worth of rest before you start your sleep programme, but as a human being, we're all wired to cope slightly differently. How are you going to manage going back upstairs, putting your child into bed, coming back downstairs, and before you've even got to the bottom step, you can hear their feet hit the floor, okay? How are you going to stay patient and calm and utterly boring, okay? So you're going to have to be really dull. When you put your child back into bed, you stick to a script. You say the same words, you don't pick them up, you don't cuddle them, you don't give them eye contact, no tickles, no last kiss for mummy, none of that. It's simply, you very simply, calmly and gently put them back into bed. Every single time they get out. And that might be 33 times before you get in your bed. Just to get downstairs, almost got the coffee cup to your lips. The programme that you're desperate to watch is starting and the child is there. You have to turn round, take them calmly, quietly, no interaction put them back into bed. And you are committing to doing that as often as it takes. And you can count them, because you're going to count them, because you're going to know that last night was a terrible night, it was 33, tonight was just as bad, oh no, but wait a minute, when I count, only 32. Okay, we're making progress. Right? But you do need to know what it's possible for you to put up with, because if in fact you become very distressed yourself when your child cries, and you're having to do this on your own, it will be very difficult for you to persist and you will give in. And the giving in creates another set of problems. So whatever it is you're going to decide to do, you're going to stick to. All right? And that you must be honest with yourself and know what you personally can deal with. And then we need to work out, you know, what are we going to say when it goes wrong? So you've put your child back into bed 20 times, this time they get out and fall over. So now they're crying and you hear the change in the cry and you know it's because they've bashed their knee. Well, of course you're going to respond like a nurturing parent, but very calmly and quietly you're going to deal with the incident and then get back on track. All right? But you're not going to, oh, well, never mind, just for tonight and break the rules. Okay? You deal with whatever it is that's happened, get back on track. But try not to be highly stimulating, interesting, keep the child alert and awake. Okay? One of the things that's really difficult is when you're, you're following a sleep programme together with somebody else, is that you're both tired and stressed. Change is stressful, okay? So one of you is going and putting the child back to bed and the other one is apparently sitting on the sofa doing nothing whilst you're doing all the work. It is incredibly easy because you're tired and stressed and upset to get into a row. So you find that you're downstairs rowing, and rowing is stimulation. So whatever happens, you've got to kind of sit on how you're feeling, sort it out together as a, um, as a team, and stay on track. But it is really hard to do. So if perhaps your partner is the one that's going upstairs and putting them back into bed, and you think, oh, that time he actually said, um, you know, I'm getting tired now, so go to sleep, and that's not in the script. So you think you might tell your partner, you've got to stay on the script. Okay? That's unlikely to be advice that's going to be well received. Your partner is doing their best, they're very stressed. What they need is somebody going, well done, we're nearly there. You know, and you can discuss later or the next day how things might be tweaked. But when you're really struggling to keep things going, it is hard if somebody perhaps suggests that you haven't done it right. It's very easy to be triggered into an argument. Um, okay, so um, you're going to develop a script and you're going to praise and approve staying on plan for yourself and when the child the next morning is looking a bit kind of baggy eyed because they've been up and down countless times, you go well done, good sleeping in your own bed, well done, mum is very pleased with you, dad is very pleased with you, auntie Mary is pleased with you, we have phone granny, she's pleased with you because trying something new is difficult. It's difficult for the child. It makes much more sense for the child to stick with um, doing what they're already doing. Okay, so the wind down hour. One hour before you put your child into bed in order to leave them in their bed to sleep for the night. No computer, no screen based activity. Not downstairs, not upstairs in that wind down hour. Okay. Positive attention. 
you are going to be available for your child. Because one of the things that can happen is if you've had a difficult day and there are a number of things that have gone wrong for your child and there have been a number of things which have been really stressful for you, perhaps your child um, whipped all the tins off the uh, shelf in the supermarket and two people came up and huffed and blowed and sighed and tutted and told you that they wouldn't let their child do that and then the car didn't start and you couldn't find a parking space when you got home and all these things. You've had a really difficult day is that it can build this wonderful thing called parental guilt, right? where you think, I'm not a very good mummy, I should have done this, I should have done that, and now you're going to abandon your child at night. You are no longer going to lie down with them and help them go back to sleep. And if you're, if you're feeling guilty, that will push you to break the rules. So in the wind down hour, you are available for your child. You are going to give your child the attention that they're currently getting during the night or in the messing about going to sleep. You're going to give them their attention, your attention, sorry, in the wind down hour. So in the wind down hour, you invest in being available to your child, not being busy talking on the phone, not multitasking, but being available to your child, sitting calmly or, you know, discussing things with them if they can talk, playing favourite games with them if they're quiet and calm games, reading them stories. That is when you are giving your child positive attention. So reading stories, leg massage or a back massage, that's a very good place to put it in the wind down hour. The last drink of the day and the last snack of the day should come at the beginning of the wind down hour. And the snack should not be something crunchy and exciting like crisps, it should be something like um, slightly warm milk, if your child will take milk, banana, okay, not crunchy apple which wakes you up, not carrot sticks, <laughs> that wakes you up, all those things are very stimulating, you know, something that is soothing, okay, if, if that's what you do. Um, you're going to think through your bedtime routine and work it out step by step, deciding on whatever technique you're going to use. Okay, so if your bedtime routine is going to be bath, teeth, nappy and pyjamas, wind down hour, then upstairs, into bed, kiss goodnight, say goodnight, it's time to sleep, I'll see you in the morning, walk out of the room. You write it down, it's really important to write it down, because if you don't, you'll forget or somebody else will come in with a whole set of different ideas. So, you have your wind down hour. Okay, so we'll say that will start at seven. And then at eight o'clock, okay, it might be um, uh, kiss daddy, good night. Okay, and that's downstairs, then it's um, 8.05, you go upstairs, okay, this is not the time when you're having a long conversation with Daddy, it's kiss Daddy goodnight, go upstairs, in bed, kiss goodnight, light off, Say it's night time. Good night. Sleep tight. Whatever, whatever phrase it is that you have, it may, might be that mummy loves you. See you in the morning. Whatever it is, but you write it down, okay? And then the best bit. Leave the room, or whatever it is, or sit on the floor if you're doing a gradual withdrawal. Okay, so by 8.15, we've got here. This would be my good night routine. So from 8 o'clock to 8.15, not 8.20, not 8.30 because we suddenly thought of another lo you know, lovely bit of conversation we might have with mummy. Not 8.30 because I've asked for another leg massage. Not 8.30 because I heard the phone ring and I just wanted to see who it was. Okay, not 8.30 because I went downstairs to get another drink because I said I was thirsty. Not 8.30 because I asked mummy to get me another biscuit. None of those things. Not 8.30 because I think I've got a little something stuck in my teeth and I think mummy might need to brush my teeth again. None of those things. You just, once you're here, you go through the process and that is the way it's going to be. And you can write a similar one actually for your wind down hour as well so the child can see what's available in the wind down hour. 
And then you need to agree your plan with whoever else is involved and you need to decide what day you're starting. We are starting on Saturday or we are starting on Sunday. Set a date when you're actually going to get going. The first thing you've done is tidy your child's bedroom. Second thing, you're going to write your plan and decide what technique you're going to use. Um, and what are you going to say if the child wakes in the night? Okay, you're going to look at what you said before. It's night time, good night, sleep tight. For the first time they get out of bed. It's night time, good night, sleep tight for the second time. I would suggest you only say it three times. After that, the child knows. And simply repeating the script is unnecessary. So I would then just put them back into bed. Okay? But you really need to know exactly what you're going to do every single time. Because you're tired, your short-term thinking cuts in, and you'll go back to what you were doing before. So you really need to be on it. And in terms of giving the message to the child, how does the child know what is expected? The child is expecting to do what they've always done. How do they know? We need to go visual. So we use these kind of picture strips here, where it's got bath, pyjamas or nighty on, depending whether you've got a girl or a boy, obviously, brush your teeth, time for bed, or whatever your routine is. You simply draw it on a piece of paper, um, or there are plenty of these kind of pictures and symbols on the internet. And this tells the child exactly what's expected. All right? There's no extra drink, no extra leg massage, no running out into the garden to have a bounce on the trampoline because it's a nice evening. None of those things. It's simply, this is what's going to happen. And a child with very limited speech will get the idea from the pictures, and a child who's got a lot of speech will get the idea, this is the way it's going to be, this is the plan. Other things that you can use are these kind of special clocks, which in the night are blue, and then you set the time uh, that you want the child to be awake, and it changes to the sun. So the child can have a visual cue in the room, it's night time, or it's daytime. Um, and they can be very, very effective with children who are having difficulty understanding when the right times are. Um, the script, as we said before, work out exactly what you're going to say and stick to it. And what will you say when things go wrong? Stick to the script. All right? And if your child is in bed but now yelling and calling for tea, biscuits, another hug, another read of a story, I can't see my legs hurting, all the things that they will come up with, absolute multiple reasons why they need you urgently, what are you going to do to keep yourself busy so that you don't find yourself at the bottom of the stairs calling up or just popping in to check that everything's all right and changing your basic routine, okay? Find yourself something that you are definitely going to do so that you can keep yourself busy and how are you going to stop yourself giving up? Find somebody to encourage you, it's really important. There is unfortunately a little something called the extinction response, which is a known psychological effect, and this is where the saying, it gets worse before it gets better, comes from, because in fact, it often does. The child has learned from past experience that if they get out of bed, you will take them into bed with you, if, if co-sleeping is the thing that you're addressing. The child has learned. Their brain, their experience, their whole life experience, when I scream, eventually I sleep with mummy and daddy. Okay, that's it. So they scream, but now you've got a plan. You put them back in their own bed. They scream, you put them back in their own bed. The child is quite likely to think, I can't be doing enough of what worked in the past. So they scream louder and longer. Okay, and you think, oh, this new sleep program is just making them worse. What's happening is the child's brain is pressing the button that usually works, but more thoroughly, just to check if it's really going to work. So you will go through a period where the child appears to get worse, and that is when you must stick to your plan. So the extinction response is a very trying thing, but uh, it's a normal part of changing behaviour. Um, and you need to stay on plan for days. Stay on plan for days. It's not going to work one day, two days, three weeks you should commit to this. If your child is ill during that time, of course you are going to nurture and care for your child safely. Of course. And then when they're better, you get back on plan. Okay? But a child who's running a temperature shouldn't be ignored in the night. Clearly not. Okay? So you would do whatever is necessary to keep your child safe, healthy and well, and then you get on plan. And every now and again, 
you'll find um, with the family I'm working with at the moment, um, they were doing really well, they'd had four nights of more or less unbroken sleep, and then on Sunday morning they turned over and the child was in bed with them. They were so knackered from multiple times of putting him back into bed, they didn't feel him get in, they were so fast asleep themselves. Well, don't beat yourself up about it, you're just human beings, you know? You think, okay, tomorrow night, back, back to square one, you know? But that's okay. It won't take as long to make the same amount of progress again. Right? But every now and again, things go wrong just because we're human beings. Just accept it, get back on track, we're all right, no problem. And we need to listen and encourage each other. It takes time. It's difficult for us to change as adults. It's difficult for the child to change. But good, what they call good sleep hygiene, good sleep hygiene, knowing how to rest, knowing how to sleep, is actually a life skill. If it means your child becomes more tolerant, more patient, more able to learn, um, and less reactive, less challenging, less um, struggle with new ideas, you are investing hugely in improving your child's quality of life and your own, but you are changing the possibilities for your child's future. Okay? This is something that will work for life. It is much easier if you do it when your child is little, because physically it's less challenging, but also the child hasn't practiced the old habits for as many years. So, if you're ready to give it a go, get started, commit three weeks to it, and there's every likelihood that you will have improved your child's life and taught them a life skill, and that you will have improved the quality of life for the entire family. So, good luck. Thank you. My child sleeps in the daytime, does it matter? Well, sleeping in the daytime is a part of, of how children develop up to, a, um, up to a certain age, but remember what you're doing is you're counting the number of hours your child sleeps in a 24-hour period. So if your child is sleeping for two hours during the day, and then sleeping at eight hours at night, and 10 hours is what's the right sort of average for a child of your age, they're getting quite enough sleep, and they're not going to sleep any longer at night. If you want them to sleep longer at night, they need to lose some of those hours during the day. So think about the total number of hours, and don't let your child nap much later than two o'clock in the day, if possible. My child snores a lot. Is that a problem? Probably not, but you do need to get your child checked over by a doctor before you start a sleep programme. I always leave the light on outside my son's bedroom door and I leave the door a bit open. He won't go to sleep without that set up. I mean, is that okay? Well, leaving the light on does give your child a visual cue that, still, that things are still, you know, light and that perhaps they might confuse that with daytime. So you want to reduce the lighting as much as possible. Perhaps use a night light plugged in at a low level in the hall rather than leaving the hall light on. Remember that a part of what triggers the child to make melatonin, which is the hormone that makes you feel sleepy, naturally occurs in your body, is lowered light levels. So you want to keep things as dark as possible. My son likes to fall asleep watching a DVD and if we try and stop him he gets really upset. Should we let him go on watching? That is a difficult one, I know, but um, there are two things here. One, we want your child to learn how to fall asleep in their bed on their own and that is a skill for life. And the other thing is that the flashing bright images coming into your child's eye is actually keeping their brain stimulated and that is preventing the child really from getting drowsy and sleepy. I know there's going to be a row, so you need to make sure that that happens at the start um, or just when you're about to begin your wind down hour. That's when you turn the DVD off, get the row out of the way. Yes, he will be upset until he realizes that that's it and you're going to hold that boundary. My son takes ages to settle in the evening and he'll get out of bed over and over again. Um, so the only way I can get him to stay in bed is if I get into bed with him and then I fall asleep as well. That is a real problem and it's because you're tired at the end of the day. But what we're trying to do is to get the child into the habit of settling on their own. So you need to decide, are you going to put her into bed and walk out of the room? Or are you going to put her into bed and sit on the floor, perhaps near the bed, but facing away? So you're going to do a gradual withdrawing. And actually, 
to begin with, she will continue to get out of bed and she might get upset, but you need to have a clear idea in mind that you're simply going to put her back into bed every single time she gets out. And then we will change her understanding of, of the routine that's necessary, but you have just got to do it. My son takes ages to settle in the evening and he'll get out of bed over and over again. Um, so the only way I can get him to stay in bed is if I get into bed with him and then I fall asleep as well. And I think that's so normal for the circumstances. You're absolutely exhausted. But what we want to do is to establish a habit for the child to fall asleep in their own bed on their own. That's what we're aiming for. So you need to think, are you going to put them into bed and then leave the room? Or are you going to put them into bed and then sit on the floor with your back to your child so that there's no stimulation coming from you, no eye contact, no chat, and gradually work your way to the door um, over a period of days. But in the end, you are going to have to keep putting them back into bed. So every time they get out, you're very boring, you don't chat, you don't give them any eye contact or any stimulation, and you keep putting them back. And it's only in that way that your child will begin to understand that this is the way um, this is the way it's going to be from now on, which is you're going to lie down in bed and fall asleep on your own. In the evening, about the time that my husband gets home from work is when we're starting to begin the bedtime routine. He really enjoys playing with the children, and I like that, and, and they enjoy the rough and tumble, but I think it winds them up before bedtime. So should I stop it? It is a really difficult one, this, because it's important to relationships and it's important that children do play um, you know, with your partner and that that shared good time is a part of their day. But it needs to come at the beginning of the wind-down hour, if it's very exciting, and perhaps to last five to ten minutes. And then for your partner to be available, perhaps to read them a story or to take a big interest in what they're doing, but something calmer. So I wouldn't lose it completely, but I would put it at the beginning of the wind-down hour. This is a part of how we, we celebrate and enjoy our day, but it's a brief period of time, very enjoyable and then after that, the activities must be calmer. And that perhaps is a more practical solution rather than saying you mustn't do it, which would be a loss for everybody involved. My son will only go to sleep at night if he's got a dummy in, which is fine, except when he rolls over and the dummy falls out. And then he wakes up the whole household crying and we have to go and find the dummy and put it back in. <laughs> we really need some help. Basically, your child has learnt the routine of falling asleep sucking. So they're sucking the dummy and that provides the comfort that they have got used to and they fall asleep. So then if they wake in the night, and remember waking in the night is normal, they are, will seek the same situation. So they're looking for something to suck because that's how they've learned to fall asleep. So you've either got to teach your child to find their own dummy if it falls out in the night, perhaps by using their hand to search for it rather than you rootling around and plugging it back in, or Perhaps now's the time to think about investing the time in helping the child understand how to fall asleep without a dummy.